So, you want to make your own fully custom mechanical keyboard from scratch, but don't know where to begin. This video seeks to walk you through the process of designing, building, and flashing your custom keyboard. To begin, it's important to have a basic understanding of some electronic components, such as resistors, capacitors, diodes, crystals, microcontrollers, and LEDs. If you're unsure about any of these, it's a good idea to do some research before starting this project. Additionally, it's important to be able to read and interpret data sheets for at least your chosen microcontroller. This project is likely to be complex and time consuming, so it's probably not a good idea for beginners or those who are brand new to electronics. This project can be broken down into four main steps. Layout, schematic, PCB, and assembly. While soldering is typically required for assembly, it is possible to skip this step by using machine assembly. This may be a good option for those who don't have the time or expertise to do the soldering work themselves. This tutorial will assume the most difficult, that you plan to hand solder the board yourself. Let's start with the most important part, the layout. Whether you like 40, 60, or 110% boards, you need a template. Keyboard Layout Editor is the tool for the job, which you can see here. We're going to ignore the somewhat complicated GUI and just edit the raw JSON. It may look scary or complicated, but it's really not that bad. Take a look. We can start a row by opening square brackets and putting our keys in this comma-separated list like so. We can add another row by adding a comma to the end of the line and doing the same thing over again. Here, I'm left with a simple approximation of a numpad. To expand upon this, we can use the W and H modifiers to change the width and height of our keys. I'll modify my 2 key to be 2 units wide, and I'll modify my 4 key to be 2 units high by opening a curly brace, typing W colon 2, and closing the curly brace. Don't forget to add a comma to separate the modifier from the key text. Finally, we can discuss positioning and rotation. Positioning uses the X and Y modifiers. I can add a space between my 1 and 2 keys by opening a curly brace, typing X colon 1, and closing the curly brace. Don't forget to add a comma. Similarly, I can move my second row down by adding a Y colon 1 at the beginning of my second row. Note that this moves the whole row. It can be shifted back up by doing Y colon negative 1. And rotation. You can use the R modifier to apply a rotation in degrees. Note that this rotates the entire row. Using X causes our key to float out here in space. We can use RX or RY to move horizontally or vertically relative to the rest of the keyboard, ignoring rotation. See the Ergodox preset for an example of this. Armed with this knowledge, you should now be able to complete your layout. Note that there are presets for boards up in the menu bar, so you can save yourself some work by starting from a base. Once you've created a layout you're satisfied with, download it as a PNG and save the raw JSON. We'll use the PNG image when we create our switch matrix later. One last important thing regarding layout pertains to keycaps. Make sure that keycaps are available for your chosen layout. I've struggled to find F13 through F24 caps that don't cost at least one of my kidneys. With our layout complete, let's move on to the switch matrix. A switch matrix is a grid of keys in rows and columns that allows a microcontroller to detect which keys are being pressed using a limited number of inputs and outputs (I/O). This is necessary because most microcontrollers don't have a large number of I.O. pins, making it impractical to assign each key its own pin. By using a switch matrix, we can have many keys on fewer pins, making the design more efficient. Good designs also include diodes, which prevent ghosting. Ghosting can occur when multiple keys are pressed simultaneously, causing the incorrect key to be registered. Open the key map you just exported from KLE in your favorite GNU image manipulation program and draw some lines. These lines will make up the columns of our switch matrix. If you're using a more typical rectangular board, the rows should be self-explanatory. If not, Godspeed. Just kidding, you should also draw rows. Note that only one key can exist on a given row and column. Color coding your lines should help with visibility, but if you're a masochist, use yellow on a white background. To be maximally efficient, you need to use a square for your switch matrix. In other words, the number of columns must match the number of rows. This can lead to a high degree of difficulty in routing, however, so it is recommended to use the smallest number of rows and columns that is reasonable and easy to route. Keep in mind that wires need to connect between each key, and if you're designing a PCB, your wires cannot intersect. For my example keyboard, I get a map that looks something like this. Sum up the rows and columns, because now it's time to talk microcontrollers. This tutorial covers the QMK software, 
but you're free to use any software you'd like. If you plan to use QMK, you'll need to pick up one of these supported microcontrollers. The most common seems to be the ATmega 32U4. If you need a ton of I.O. for a large build like mine, I'd recommend looking at the 1890 USB lineup, or an STM32. This tutorial targets implementing a raw microcontroller, but you can totally use a pre-made dev board or module. In fact, that may be a better place to start if you don't have a ton of soldering experience but still plan to hand solder, as the pads are larger and the tiny soldering work has been done for you. Start by selecting any of the listed microcontrollers that you can find in stock, then take a look at its datasheet. The most important feature to pay attention to is the GPIO. You'll need at least enough GPIO to cover the rows and columns of your switch matrix. Now is also a good time to think about your microcontroller's package. Make sure it's something you can solder. Take some time to think about your desired feature set as well. Do you want an OLED display, a rotary encoder, RGB LEDs? Each of these features may impact your required I.O. or choice of microcontroller. For example, an OLED display such as the SSD1306 will require a microcontroller that supports I2C or SPI communication. I2C is generally easier to implement because it requires fewer connections, but it may not be suitable for all types of displays or microcontrollers. Check your selected micros datasheet for more information. You should also verify that QMK supports your chosen OLED. A typical rotary encoder requires two dedicated I.O. pins for its rotation axes. Some encoders also have a push switch, which can be included in your switch matrix to conserve I.O. You can matrix multiple encoders rotary axes together, which is covered in more detail in the QMK documentation. There are many types of RGB LED, but my preference is the WS2812 LEDs, as only a single wire is required to communicate with more than 100 LEDs. This is because each LED communicates with the next in the chain. Additionally, no special features are required to use these. Note that the more LEDs there are in the chain, the lower their refresh rate. Up to 200 per chain should be safe, but refer to the datasheet for more information. Another very important property to pay attention to is your microcontroller's operating voltage. If it takes 5 volts, you can safely connect it straight to USB power, but you'll be required to include a voltage regulator if it takes a different voltage, such as 3.3 volts. Here's a small table that compares some of the more common options. Now that you know what your layout looks like, what microcontroller you're going to use, and the add-ons you'd like, it's time to start the schematic, which we'll do in part 2. Subscribe if you found this helpful, and let us know what I missed or what you'd like to see in the comments below.